Coming up, season two of Netflix's Spirit Rangers is out now. We speak to the show's creator on what to expect. Plus, Holly Cook Macaro delves into the debt ceiling talks. And what Native American bills will soon become law in Montana? We learn the latest from our Mountain Bureau. I'm Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. We start today in Salish and Kootenai territory where anguish and outrage are boiling up following the death of a young native woman. Blackfeet citizen Micah Westwolf was killed by a vehicle while walking along a highway on Montana's Flathead Reservation in March. Since then, no arrests have been made in the 22-year-old's death. The highway patrol says investigations take time, but Westwolf's parents and her community are demanding action. They've set up a tip line and a website called micamatters.com. Her parents said on the website, we will not allow this to become another unsolved missing and murdered indigenous women case. It's not uncommon for people to walk alongside the shoulder of busy highways. They are often the only continuous roads through reservations in Montana where public transit is non-existent. Current data shows the murder rate for native women is 10 times the national average, according to the CDC. If you have any information on Micah's death, call 406-240-8229. A museum in Vermont is undertaking a big project for the study and care of indigenous art. The newly announced Native American initiative at the Shelburne Museum includes the construction of a building for its large collection of indigenous art. The $12 million Perry Center for Native American Art will house a collection that represents nearly 80 tribes from coast to coast. It is set to be the 40th building on the museum's 45-acre campus. Some of the steps taken by the Museum for Cultural Competency include the addition of an associate curator of Native American art. Chief of the Nulhegan Band of the Kusuk Abenaki Nation, Don Stevens, said he sees the center as a place to learn more about Indigenous people. The next phase of the project will be to work with Indigenous partners on the, build, on the design of the building. Tribal nations and government agencies may soon be able to collaborate a bit easier. Last week, an environmental law group and a nonprofit law firm announced they will develop a digital repository of tribal consultation policies and resources. The partnership is between the Environmental Law Institute and the Native American Rights Fund. They say that far too often, tribal communities are impacted by the decisions of environmental agencies and others without being consulted first. This resource is aimed to be a first of its kind at strengthening communication lines with sovereign tribes and local, state, and federal agencies. It is set to be an extensive library of educational tools and resources, including a collection of existing laws and policies. The project is being funded by a $250,000 grant from the Henry Luce Foundation. Turning to news about news, last week, two Native storytellers graced the list of this year's Pulitzer Prize winners. Connie Walker, who is from the Okanese First Nation, and the Gimlet Media team won for their audio work called Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's. It explored the abuse of Indigenous children at a residential school in Canada. Ojibwe writer Michael John Whitgen was named a finalist in history for his book called 
Seeing Red, Indigenous Land, American Expansion, and the Political Economy of Plunder in North America. Walker says Native stories matter and hopes this means more people will hear the stories of boarding school survivors. Well, a television drama focused on investigating the cold cases of missing and murdered Indigenous people has been canceled. ABC announced it will not bring Alaska Daily back for a second season. The television show, starring actress Hilary Swank, struggled to pick up in the ratings from its October 2022 debut. For those who did tune in, the show is pretty well received, getting an 86% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. Swank was also nominated for a Golden Globe Award for her role on the series. Despite the positive reception, there just weren't enough people watching for ABC to commit to another season. The network also canceled Big Sky and the company you keep. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. The adventures of Summer, Eddie, and Cody Skyseeder continue in the Netflix series Spirit Rangers. Just last week, the second season of the animation was released. We are joined now virtually with the series creator, Carissa Valencia. Hello there, Carissa. Hi there. Happy to be here. The last time we spoke with you, Spirit Rangers was about to be released, and you said you couldn't wait for the world to see the hard work that went into this series. How are you feeling now after the second season has been unveiled? Oh, it's been... Um... Uh, it's been incredibly overwhelming, I think. Animation takes a really long time, so I feel like we've been sitting on this um, beautiful indigenous secret with all of our animation um, ready to be shown to the world. So I've been really happy and really you know, elated that I get to celebrate everyone's hard work and everyone gets to see what we've been doing the past couple of years. Tell us what to expect in season two of Spirit Rangers. So season two, we have our three main heroes are back in action. Um, they now have some new villains called the Trickster Trio, where we're honoring different tricksters from um, various tribes. Um, we also have some of our real life native heroes in the show that are animated. We have an episode with Aaron Yazi, mechanical engineer over at NASA. He is now animated visiting Coos Park, which is really fun. Um, we also have a chief that visits it's the National Park, voiced by Chief Gary Batten from the Choctaw Nation. Uh, so that's been really exciting to bring in our real-life Native heroes into this world and um, give them that spotlight. We also have a incredible season finale that really honors, you know, all the Indigenous folks and non-Indigenous folks that are fighting climate change. So that one is incredibly um, exciting. You mentioned the NASA engineer Aaron Yazi as part of the voice actors in season two. Tell us why it was important for you to bring a character like him to this animation series. Yeah, this is one of my favorite episodes. I think it was important to show again that, you know, our people are here in the modern day space using modern science as well as our traditional ecological knowledge. So Aaron comes in with, um, you know, his expertise at NASA showing that you can be indigenous studying the stars, um, you know, remembering your Navajo stories, but also using modern technology. So it was really important for us to bring him in and show kids around the world that we're still here and we have really cool jobs and can use our science and power. And it's just, it, it was really fun to bring him in and have him voice himself as a cartoon. I'm curious if the all native writer's room from season one transitioned to, to season two. Yes, the majority did. And we actually added a few more, um, which was awesome. So we have new stories in this season that are from various tribes. We have a couple more Choctaw stories. Um, we also have a Maori story that uh, features Tamara Morrison, who is Boba Fett. Um, yeah, it's been really cool to expand the universe and just really celebrate different indigenous uh, tribes all over the world. You had previously said that you hope this show educates non-Native people about the modern Indigenous family. Do you think that you've accomplished part of that goal so far? Definitely. I Some of my favorite... Um 
Yeah, some of my favorite moments are just like taking in all the love from social media that we've received. And I think um, it's been really powerful for me to hear, you know, non-Native kids wanting to be Cody, Summer, and Eddie. They want to be heroes like them and they look up to them. They see them as heroes. They see them as friends. And that's really all I want. I just want them to, you know, see us as existing now and that we can be heroes too. I'm really curious if you can talk about the acclaim that this show has gotten. I saw that you were nominated for an Annie Award. Yes, um, we were nominated for an Annie. Um, that was really a special moment because our animation partners are Super Prod Animation, which are based all the way in France. And they, um, you know, I always say they got the... U.S. Native American history course they never asked for, but they have worked so hard with all of our consultants from various tribes to make this show feel really signature and create a whole new Native world. So I was really happy that our art director, Marie uh, Delmas, was um, nominated and that the show overall was nominated for Best, Best Preschool. So um, it's been it's been really great to see the reception has been so positive so far. And we're just, we've just premiered like six or seven months ago. So I've been uh, really, really proud of the team. You mentioned that this series was created for the preschool audience. Well, I have to admit that I've seen Spirit Rangers. I saw the whole first season and I love the whole thing, <laughs> even though I'm not the demographic. Um, I'm really curious for you, Carissa, how do you maintain creativeness in this space, um, specifically creating a world for young children, even though you're an adult? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think a lot of the times when I'm writing or creating, I don't think about what preschoolers like in a way. Like I think about myself and what would baby Carissa like to have seen on TV? What would have got her excited? What would have wanted her to like, you know, be that character for Halloween? Um, just so it's really authentic. And so that's what I do when I'm thinking about writing for children. I'm really thinking about little me and what I would have liked. And I know me personally, I would have loved to see my shoe mash culture on screen, see our California native lore. Um, it's, and I'm just like very happy that we've been so rewarded with the Spirit Rangers and I'm getting to show like putting our language in the series, um, showing off a lot of our indigenous stories. So yeah, it's definitely a process. And I think like, in addition to thinking about, you know, the little you and what you would have liked, um, I still... I have that side of me that is still writing other stuff that's not preschool. I think keeping my brain going in different areas is also helping the creative process. Well, Spirit Rangers creator, uh, Carissa Valencia, thank you so much. And please join us again in the future. Yes, thanks for having me. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the United States could default on its debt as early as June 1st if lawmakers do not raise or suspend the nation's borrowing limit before then. Here's the question we always ask. How would this affect Native communities? ICT regular contributor Holly cook Macaro joins us now with more. She is a partner with Spirit Rock Consulting and a board member of Indige Public Media, the parent company that owns ICT and the ICT newscast. Hi there, Holly. Hi, Aaliyah. It's good to see you. We continue to hear that if the debt ceiling issue isn't resolved, we are on the road to a global financial crisis. What are the options on the table right now from both Republicans and Democrats to avoid that happening? Well, the clock is ticking. We've talked about this uh, a couple of times over the last month or so as, as we've moved toward the deadline that Secretary Yellen has indicated is the first week of June there. So um, given the Memorial Day holiday coming up and the number of legislative days they're in session, they've got less than 15 days really to come to an agreement uh, before we, our country defaults on, on, um, on our debt. So we um, are under a tremendous amount of pressure. And for Indian country, there are um, a number, there are Basically, three things I think that are at the top of the list as, as what we're looking at as policy writers accompanying the debt ceiling bill. Those are budget caps, permitting reform, and the reclamation of COVID money. Um, budget caps, as we all know, um, could have a serious impact if it's an across the board cut 
and we see, um, you know, our already underfunded programs like the Indian Health Service and others at the Department of Interior. If we get an across the board cut at these departments, Indian country is going to feel it first because of our direct relationship with the federal government, those impacts directly into Indian country. On permitting reform, there are serious concerns. Joe Manchin is driving that that uh, piece of the the negotiations and the talks, and um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure that he has um, Indian country's best interests at heart. He has a project in his state that is a priority for him, and there are others who are weighing in, um, both on, on the climate justice side, on climate change, all of those. But for Indian country, that means that if if NEPA is is streamlined or the, and that process is changed, that NEPA could be waived that tribal consultation could be off the table. All of those things are important to us when we look at things like um, uh, mining, leasing on our lands and others. So the permitting reform, I think, is um, really worth Indian country weighing in on as well. And re the reclamation of COVID money, that could have a devastating impact. All of Indian country worked so hard to make sure that we had extended timelines in order to provide tribal governments that time to spend the funds, the, the historic level of funding that were included both in the CARES Act and in ARPA. And so now the, the, the Republican side of the aisle is saying unspent funds, that they pull those back in order to help fund our government and uh, balance the budget. So kind of, I would say, a tier two, although McCarthy says this is a, a, a red line for him. I'll, there's a lot of red lines people are putting out there. Our worker requirements and um, modifications to social welfare programs like uh, what we call TANF, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, which a lot of Indian families rely on for support services. So as we move through these talks, there's a lot for Indian country to be paying attention to. We've heard those alarm bells from Secretary Janet Yellen on this issue. What role does Treasurer Lynn Malerba play in this conversation? And just as a reminder for our viewers, Treasurer Malerba is the first Native person selected to serve in that leadership role. Yes, and it's exciting to see um, the role that she is playing. I would say that we don't normally have a voice at that, that level that is able to advocate for Indian country programs. And in addition to the roles of the treasurer, um, you know, so Treasurer Malerba of the Mohegan Nation in Connecticut, got to give her tribe a shout out. Um, she doesn't have an in the room role in the negotiations process, but for Indian country's interests, she does advise the treasury secretary Yellen on the tribal funding and is working very hard to protect it. I've spoken to um, her team a few times over the last few weeks because they've had such a huge role in the implementation and distribution of funds included in the CARES and ARPA. So her ability to advocate and protect Indian funding and that voice in Secretary Yellen's ear is just another example of how important it is to have Indian people in these roles at the first, very highest levels of the government in order to advocate for those things that like, are funding that are going to hit us very quickly. My understanding is that Secretary Yellen is the sole negotiator from Treasury regarding the debt limits, but while there are, Treasurer Malerba, I don't think has the ability to make public comments, but um, she really is working very hard at the in protecting tribal funding as these negotiations continue. Holly, you mentioned that there is likely only 15 days to get this um, passed by both chambers and of course by the president. Do you think that that is actually doable? You know, I always want to, Excuse me. I always want to uh, be hopeful that that is going to happen. Um, and as we've all seen, the thing that drives them the most is the clock ticking towards midnight on the day that um, that the deadline occurs. So uh, uh, I heard some talk over the week that there could be a one month extension. Um, I think that everyone hopes we get this done before then so we can move on to different pieces of legislation and we've got the whole appropriations process in front of us over the summer. So I'm still holding out hope and um, although there, do there does seem to be a lot of room between the two sides on those, particularly on those top three items that I mentioned. Well, ICT regular contributor Holly cook Macaro, thank you as always. Thank you, Leah.
Montana's legislature meets once every two years to create laws on the state's most pressing issues. Some of those laws have made it all the way to Governor Greg Gianforti's desk. Here to share which ones is Jovan Wagner. She is a legislative fellow with ICT and the Montana Free Press. Hi, Jovan. Welcome to the ICT Newscast. Hi, it's great to be here. Montana is very close to joining a number of other states in passing bills related to the Indian Child Welfare Act. Give us the update on what's happening there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so House Representative Jonathan Windyboy, who is a part of the Montana American Indian Caucus, <clears throat> sponsored a House bill that would codify the Indian Child Welfare Act into Montana law. Um, the bill did get amended a couple times, but ultimately passed through the legislature and is now waiting for the governor's uh, decision. Um, Wendy Boy has said throughout the session that this bill was a big motivation um, due to the state, um, the Brackeen versus Holland Supreme Court case that is dealing with the federal ICWA. Um, if, the, if, if, the governor, if the governor signs this into law, Montana would be the 12th state to secure ICWA protections at the state level. I want to move to another bill, which is the Indian Education for All bill. First off, tell us what that is and um, what the status is on it. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> this bill, um, also sponsored by Windy Boy, uh, aimed to revise the reporting requirements for Montana public schools on the implementation of the Indian Education for All program. Windy Boy had described this bill as an accountability bill because Montana has a constitutional mandate to require the education of the state's indigenous history. Um, essentially, this bill would require for a more detailed and thorough report from schools on how Indian education for all funds are spent and how teachers implement the curriculum. Um, this bill also comes after several Montana tribes and individuals filed for a lawsuit against the Office of Public Instruction and Board of Public Education in 2021 to address issues that the plaintiffs claim that the state hasn't been monitoring how Indian education is being taught. I want to learn more about the efforts by the state legislature to honor the late chief uh, Earl Old Person. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Senator Susan Weber, who represents a uh, district um, on the Blackfeet Reservation, introduced Senate Bill 120, um, which it will establish a memorial highway on the Blackfeet Reservation in honor of the late uh, chief or old person who passed away in October of 2021. This bill seemed simple enough to fly through the legislature, but actually it was tabled in the first committee during the session. Um, Weber blasted the bill on the Senate floor and brought the bill back where it continued to pass the Senate and House floors Jean Forte actually did sign this bill into law in April, and now the Blackfeet tribe has plans to conduct a renaming ceremony during the community's own summer powwow celebrations later in July. Oh, how exciting. We'll have to have you back for that. I want to talk about the flip side, the bills that didn't quite make it to the finish line. Um, tell us about the, the two that, you know, Native American people wanted and didn't quite make it there. Yeah, so I think the first one, uh, the bigger one, um, was uh, the Indigenous Peoples Day bill um, sponsored by Senator Shane Morjo. Uh, he carried the bill, um, and with this bill would have recognized Indigenous Peoples Day as a state holiday and would replace Christopher Columbus Day. Um, but this bill was killed pretty early in the session after a pretty heated debate on the Senate floor from lawmakers that argued um, in the defense of Christopher Columbus and Columbus Day. This was the fifth uh, time that the American Indian Caucus tried to get Indigenous Peoples Day recognized. Um, another one was the Indian Tuition Waiver, uh, which was sponsored by Windy Boy. Um, and this bill would have opened up um, students to claim descendancy for all um, 500 plus federally recognized tribes. Um, but through the session, it was amended uh, to Border it, border it only to Montana tribes. Um, unfortunately, it was also tabled. Mm -hmm. Montana has a number of Native American lawmakers. You mentioned one being uh, Jonathan Windy Boy. How would you characterize the work of Native lawmakers in this session? Yeah, um, I would describe it as hard work. Uh, the Montana American Indian Caucus um, is a bipartisan group made up of 11 lawmakers 
that represent both urban and uh, rural uh, districts in Montana. Um, this session, the legislature held a Republican supermajority. Uh, so for some caucus members, they felt that it was it was quite difficult to pass laws that um, they felt was important for their constituents due to other bills being debated, um, such as anti-abortion bills, health care and budget bills. Um, but we're satisfied with the bills that they did manage to get through the session, such as the Montana ICWA and the Indian Education for All. Giovanna, I understand that you're starting a, a new position uh, with us at ICT. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you'll be with us. Yeah, so I am going to be the intern for the Mountain Bureau for ICT, um, and I'll be interning until October. Um, and so I'm excited to start uh, sharing stories of, you know, Indian country in Montana. Are there particular uh, beats or topics that interest you the most? Well, I've been focusing on the uh, the pol politics of the legislature, um, but I am I am I'm looking forward to covering um, any and all uh, education, um, politics. Um, yeah, I I anything honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jovan Wagner from ICT's newly established uh, Mountain Bureau. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.